The Foundation Fighting Blindness presents Music to Our Eyes, a Foundation Fighting Blindness music series featuring critically acclaimed singer-songwriter and producer Mark Arelli. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our sixth edition of Music to Our Eyes. My name is Jason Menzo, and I'm coming to you here from a small little club in Boston called Club Pacine. And the setting is actually really intimate and really special. So I'm sitting here, and directly to my right is a gentleman named Mark Arelli. Mark is a American singer-songwriter, a multi-instrumentalist, and a folk singer who travels all over, the, all over the country and really all over the world performing his music. He's had over a dozen albums. And his most recent, which came out in 2020, is called Blindsided. And what's interesting about that is that the album Blindsided came out right at the very beginning of the pandemic, but was actually, unbeknownst to Mark, a premonition of things to come. So Blindsided um, was about a year before Mark was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his upcoming album, Lay Your Darkness Down, and much more in just a few minutes. But to start, we're going to hear a song from the album Blindsided, and that is The River Always Wins. The diner downtown, old timers sit around. Talk about the flood of '42. How they watch from higher ground as the water took it down, like a verse from the Bible come true. After losing everything, you could hear the hammers ring as they built it back up again. The mill wheels turn, they need them to search. Washed of all their sins But the river always wins I come down from the mountain Like judgment from on high Going on to the ocean And I don't give a damn About the dreams of man Fishing poles and born again souls, lovers with their hearts ablaze. I've always been there for the lonely in despair. I took a few in my dark embrace. I seen the mills pull out and the jobs go south. It ain't never been the same way since. For everything they try to change, I will always remain. But I won't give in Cause the river always wins I come down from the mountain Like judgment from on high Going on to the ocean And I don't give a damn About the dreams of man
Yes, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you so much uh, for being here tonight. And uh, actually, I should take a moment and describe to the audience where we are. So we're here in Boston, Massachusetts, at a club called Club Passim. And uh, Mark and I are sitting here in this small little intimate space in the, uh, uh, in the club. And there's lit candles behind us and uh, a bench and lots of instruments and cameras all around. But um, for those at home, this is a great joy to get to speak with you and hear a little bit about your story. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that song that you just played, The River Always Wins. And I, you know, one of the things I think is so interesting about your story and that we talked about the first time we met was that you came out with this album called Blindsided. It's um, right before the, really at the very beginning of the pandemic, right? It's March of 2020. And that song, which I absolutely love, um, but it's, it's just so ironic that this album comes out, the song comes out, and the themes of this this uh, this album really speak to something as a almost preview of something that's going to happen in your life. You're going to find out a year later. So, yeah, I used the album title maybe one record too early. <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was trying to use Blindsided the way that I use it in the title track of that record, which is actually by being pleasantly surprised by something, you know, wonderful and, and this, this sense of falling in love with, with someone. Uh, so I was trying to uh, trying to use it in a maybe a way that it's not normally used, maybe not quite as pejoratively. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's yeah, it's definitely like so often happens. The songs sometimes get there uh, before, you know, I actually figure out what's happening. Yeah, that's so interesting. The um the songs get there before you realize what's happening. You know, is that something that happens often when you're writing music? You know, more and more. Uh, you know, you think you think you know what it's about, and or you think, well, that's a song I wrote about this, you know, character, and then it turns out, surprise, the character is, is a lot of you in the character, <laughs> or they're not you, but they're very close. You know, so yeah, I think um, there's there's something uh, that that I often am working out in songs, maybe subconsciously, that I don't fully realize, you know, uh, intellectually until, you know, maybe several years later. That's interesting. You know, one of the things that um, I notice about that song, and actually it's a lot of the lyrics that you write, is that you describe your journey through the story or your journey in the, you know, the theme of where you are in the moment of, of telling that story, but you um, use these really clear descriptions of things beyond what you see. And so uh, in, in that, you know, the river always wins, you talk about the old timers and talking about the flood and the sounds of the hammers being made. And um, in the hitter, you talk about the smell of fresh cut grass. And, yeah. you know, I, I think that's so interesting how you describe and you take your audience to a place, not just with the visual images of, of that location. Yeah, that, that is something that as a, you know, aside from any, you know, visual issues uh, or eyesight issues, that's something that just as a songwriter, I'm trying to work with the widest possible palette, the most diverse toolbox that I can bring, you know, to, to each song. And if I'm just looking around and just describing what I see, that's one way to do it. But I'm, if I'm not using the other senses, then I'm just cutting myself off from a whole uh, whole other dimensions that I can use to describe and flesh out uh, an experience or a setting or a character. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for me, using those other senses started as a songwriting, uh, a good songwriting trick, really. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, it's, it, it's become a, a little bit more, uh, more meaningful to me, you know, as uh, events have progressed. For sure. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about those events. Sure. So, um, <laughs> This is actually incredible that we're sitting here and we're having this conversation because I remember not that long ago um, you reaching out and sharing your story mm -hmm. and that um, after the album Blindsided came out and it's now we're in the middle of the pandemic and um, maybe before we talk about the actual moment where you get a diagnosis from a physician, the moment previous to that when you're on stage and uh, you go to look down at your fretboard and you can't see and uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that night, what happened. Yeah, that was, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to feel like this, but I was just informed last night that it was two years ago um, mm -hmm. as of last night. Um, but yeah, I was uh, fronting a four-piece band uh, and I was responsible for all my guitar solos. 
and I was playing electric guitar and I was all proud of myself and and uh, we did two shows two sold out shows the first one was in, at five o'clock in the evening and it was uh, late August so it was bright and it went great you know a few mistakes and we were like we're gonna come out at eight o'clock and and crush it and uh, it came out at eight o'clock and I was like who turned out the lights who turned out the sun you know like it's dark out here and and I as I made my way to stage I thought god I didn't realize it got this dark this early and uh, I did okay for you know the first three or four or five songs and then it came time to take a particularly intricate solo and I went to look down on the fretboard to see where I should put my fingers and I just couldn't make out any of the landmarks mm -hmm. I couldn't see the where the frets were I couldn't see these little dots that tell you what number fret you're on um, I had even a hard time making out what finger was on what string. And uh, I had all those thoughts in the moment that I'm supposed to look down and start taking a <laughs> guitar solo. So you can imagine that I, I, uh, I made some, some uh, fairly noticeable mistakes. Um, and uh, that just doesn't usually happen for me. Um, not like I'm a virtuoso per se, but I'm I'm well rehearsed and I do my homework. And uh, I would rather put on a strong, strongly executed program than than uh, you know risk a, a big mistake. So it was really rattling, and it happened several other times throughout the set. And I just thought like, wow, it's really dark out here. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized after the the show that you know I had set up in front of the stage. We were all spread out because it was the pandemic and uh, socially distanced as we played. And I had set up outside of the place where they had f focused the lights. And I didn't know that because when we set up, it was you know bright mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I left there that night fr frustrated, but thinking, well, I, I like an idiot. I set up outside the lights, note to self, you know, stand on the stage next time. And I just thought that that was it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, of course it was not. And uh, I would say about a month later, I was driving in uh, here in Boston along Stora Drive. Uh, it was a pandemic, so I had Stora Drive to myself, which never happens. <laughs> right? It's a busy road. It's like a tip. Yeah, it's yeah. right through Bo the city of Boston along the okay. Charles River. There's always people in front of you and beside you and back of you, just really in a hurry for you mm -hmm. to get somewhere. <laughs> you know, and uh, so there's tail lights to follow and and. Uh, all sorts of stuff. But I went down into a tunnel, a very short tunnel along the, the Charles, and th there was nobody on the road. There was no taillights in front of me. Uh, it was a bright day, but not overcast, so, uh, but not sunny, so I didn't have my sunglasses on. And I just went from the bright conditions into the tunnel and just like it was like driving into the void for what felt like an eternity. It's scary. It's probably two or three seconds, you know, I slammed on the brakes. And again, no one behind me, amazingly. And uh, until I could kind of make out the side of the tunnel and I, I kind of crawled out of there and I thought, okay, that was that was more serious than a guitar sure. mistake. Sure. <laughs> um, fortunately, it was just me in the car and there was no one else around. But after that, I, I decided, I, I think I need glasses. And I did, but I, I uh, was also checked out by a, by a specialist after that and, and was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. uh, and that starts with, uh, as you as you're aware, with the loss of peripheral vision and, and night blindness, and uh, and I I have that for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it I mean it, it has to be pretty unnerving. Um, we were talking earlier about prior to this that there'd be nights where you'd go out and um, you know, gosh, why why aren't the street lights on? Or you'd find yourself in a setting and. Um, Boy, I remembered this being brighter last time I was here. And so there was maybe evidence of it in your life, but it never really clicked that this was something different than just I wasn't standing in the spotlight during the solo, right? Yeah, I mean, and you don't really know how other people see things too. So sure. if yeah. you if you make a remark and nobody says, actually, there's lots of light here, right. um, you should maybe get checked out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if someone just lets it pass, you don't really have any way of knowing how your visual experience relates to anyone else, mm -hmm. um, whether you're seeing the same, you know, degree of shadow or light, or the, even the same hue of color. Really, um, it's funny that the the sense that is viewed as the kind of gold standard of of how you how we perceive the world is is so relative in that way. We can't really be sure that my red is your red or anything like that. 
Um, so it, it might have been happening for quite some time and my brain had just been getting used to it and, uh, and just, you know, slowly kind of adjusting. But it got to a point uh, where, you know, because the disease does not progress, um, gra uh, it doesn't progress Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it can go in fits and starts. So it might have been declining for a while gradually, and then I might have lost a little bit to the yeah. point where I noticed it suddenly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, here you are, right? We're in the middle of the pandemic. You're already disrupted in terms of the promotion of Blindsided and all the plans that you had. And now you've got this new reality that you're um, experiencing, um, you know, as an independent musician and a singer songwriter and doing this professionally, how's the last year and a half, two years been? Like, how, what did you do? Well, for, in, in a weird way, the pandemic was a little bit of a mixed blessing. You know, for work, it, it forced a lot of creativity and a lot of pivoting. Um, which after a while, just you pivot so much, you just get dizzy. You're spinning, spinning around. <laughs> Um, but we made it work. We promoted the record. I'm really proud of what we were able to do virtually. And people had a little extra time to, to watch things on TV and listen to music again. And, and so I feel like the record did pretty well, all things considered. Um, the place where the, and losing, you know, live gigs and stuff like that was, was really hard. But the place where the pandemic was a bit of a blessing was that I wasn't, in between tours when I got my diagnosis. Right. I had a six plus hour day uh, alone uh, here at Mass Eye and Ear. You know, my, no family members were allowed because they were trying to minimize exposure. So I was, you know, just alone going through this, this battery of tests. Um, and I got that diagnosis and my wife was on like conference call, you know, wow. and, um, and then Fortunately, we had time to, to, to process it a little bit. I mean, we're still processing it, right? But it wasn't like I had to go out the next weekend and, and go on tour. And she had to worry about, you know, how's he going to get around, all that stuff. So uh, in some ways, the pandem pan pandemic was a bit of a blessing in that I had space to kind of, I didn't have to go out and interact with the world that I, that I all of a sudden had trouble navigating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I could kind of just mentally and emotionally try and get my, my head around it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that moment, you know, when you first received your diagnosis is a very common thing, especially for a lot of folks who are um, watching this tonight. Um, our Music to Our Eyes series is one of the uh, first ways that many, many people in this community learn about the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And one of the blessings, I think, of this program is that folks can hear about others who are having a similar experience, that they're not alone. And Absolutely. the community and the engagement that, that comes along with it. And as you know, and I wanna make sure I mention it to everyone at home, the Foundation Fighting Blindness is the world's leading organization driving treatments and cures for blinding retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. And um, I know that you found us um, through the Music to Our Eyes series yeah. as well, which is terrific. And hopefully someone at home tonight um, you know, that is going through a challenging situation, learns of the Foundation Fighting Blindness from this interaction tonight. Absolutely. Um, and of course, if anyone wants to learn more, they can go to fightingblindness.org. But I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about the um, creative outlet that you had over this period of time and how you were able to shift your energy to focus on writing a new album and how um, your diagnosis helped to influence that album. So maybe we could talk a little, little bit about Lay Your Darkness Down. Yeah, sure. So the uh, in the immediate wake of the diagnosis, of course, like like anything, it's it, there's just shock and it's it's hard to it's hard to create the creation and and being artistic and being musical feels pretty ancillary to the the importance of what's going on. But uh, this is how I process my emotions. It's it's my spiritual practice. It's what I do for that brings me joy. It's how I communicate and connect with other people. So I had to find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't just go, I couldn't actually rely on the, the, the routine of doing it the way that I used to just, you know, go around to towns and play gigs because that wasn't happening. Right. So I actually went to a fairly dark place immediately after the diagnosis where I was like, am I going to be able to get around to the places I need to get around to? Am I going to be able to see in uh, a recording studio that I've never been in before. Like, how am I going to 
do my job. And I, I actually hit upon the solution of transforming my, uh, we moved my office into a different room and then I transformed it into this kind of cockpit of a, of a, of a, of a setup where I could be at my recording uh, in my computer and, and run all the recording software and there were guitars and drums and basses and keyboards and stuff all around me. I had mics all wired up, ready to go and I could just literally create at an arm's length. And it was through that process that I started to kind of regain uh, a, a fair degree of cre creative agency and just agency over my life in general um, and over my career. I wasn't really making a ton of music at that point. And here I was now down in my basement, basement making things that, you know, one track at a time, one instrument at a time, layering them. It started to sound like rock and roll. It started mm -hmm. to like move me, you know, it wasn't, they weren't just like, uh, oil paintings with layers of, of paint on them. They were things that I could step back and, and admire and really be moved by. And uh, so once you do it once, you, you got to do it again. And so I just started attacking all these songs. And next thing I knew, I had Lay Your Darkness Down, which is this, this brand new record that comes out early next year. That's awesome. I mean, the, the real question I want to ask is, how are you as a drummer? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I love to play drums. I started out playing drums in high school. So um, I won't say I'm a good drummer, but I love it. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, which is dangerous. Yeah, I was gonna say, and proficient because it's you know yeah. that's good. Yeah. Now I loved when I learned that that for this album that ultimately that's ex you know your process was playing each instrument, and the um, you know how therapeutic it was for your soul to really get back into music and take ownership of your life and yeah. to be able to use this creative outlet. Um, really, really special. Um, I'm so grateful that I had it, and you know precisely moving on or playing on instruments that I don't necessarily, uh, that aren't native to me, like drums or keyboards, it really sidesteps all the the normal kind of mental doubts and all that stuff. And you're just engrossed in how do I make this work? Mm -hmm. And next thing, it's like doing a model or anything that someone, you know, a puzzle, any, any, something that people do for time out of mind. You figure out the solution and it's incredibly rewarding. And that was, you know, three or four hours that you weren't, you know, anxious over yeah. your health. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that mental break. Yeah. yeah, no clarinets though, right? There's no clarinets in the album. No, yeah. I do live with a clarinetist. I could have hey. got him on the record, all but right, uh, right. I did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, well, let's talk about the first single coming off uh, of the album. Um, you're gonna wanna remember this. And as you know, this episode is airing in October. Um, which is Blindness Awareness Month, and I, I believe you're going to be releasing this single yes. here in October as well. And uh, why does this track match with that time of year? And how you know, tell us a little bit about the background. Well, I wrote it with my friend uh, Lori McKenna, mm -hmm. who's a, a nationally you know decorated yeah. songwriter, awesome. um, uh, but has also been a friend that I met here uh, at Passim you know years ago, and, and she's like a big sister to me, and we were talking during the, the pandemic and I said, I'm not writing much. And she said, I'm writing a ton. Wow. And I said, what's your secret? And she said, Zoom co-writes. <laughs> so I said, all right, you got to teach me how to do this. So um, we wrote, wrote a wonderful song together over Zoom based around a line that she actually said to me in this room. Uh, I had my 40th birthday party. It was a private party in this room. Mm. And I had a bunch of friends up on stage singing my songs right over there. and. Uh, I remember Lori was right out here and she leaned over to me and she said, pay attention, you're going to want to remember this. And that was eight years ago. And I held on to that line for eight years. And when we got on Zoom, she said, well, what do you want to write? And I said, I want to write, you're going to want to remember this. And um, so when we, you know, when we did, did the song, it was, it's really focusing on the, the importance of paying attention and really you know, not pausing things per se. You got to live your life, but to live your life as presently and and as and as fully invested as possible. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's I didn't know that that line actually originated in this room. That's actually really uh, comes there's a lot circle. of resonance. Yeah. 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 Well, do you want to play it? Absolutely. Let's hear it. Yeah. Let's... Don't know where we were going, but Rosalita was on the radio. I was drumming on the dash, and she was whistling to the 
saxophone We never promised each other But when you only have the summer It's almost like September says You're gonna wanna remember this It flies by It's easy to miss Don't blame Drink it in It happens once And it might not happen again The world's gonna keep on turning That's just the way it is So You're gonna wanna remember Picked a weekend to head up north and get out on the lake. We talk about the wives and kids and reminisce about the glory days. Years fly by and days are numbered. Now we're old enough to wonder and just wise enough to know one thing. You're gonna wanna remember this It flies by, it's easy to miss Don't play, drink it in It happens once and it might not happen again The world's gonna keep on turning That's just the way it is So you're gonna wanna remember this the last time. Don't always feel like the last time. So baby, put your hand in mine, and I promise tonight. You're gonna wanna remember this It flies by, it's easy to miss Don't play, drink it in It happens once and it might never happen again The world's gonna keep on turning That's just the way it is So You're gonna wanna remember You're gonna wanna remember You're gonna wanna remember this That was beautiful. Thank you. That was, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I love hearing you in this setting like this and hearing you with just the guitar. This is how it started, and, it, and it's how every new song starts. If it doesn't work like this, and oftentimes in this specific room, I will come and play music, you know, songs for the first time. And if it doesn't work like this here, I'm, my work is not done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that that works here. Good, <laughs> that, good, that good. works here because yeah. that's and, recorded. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I want to um, commend you on uh, this. You know, self discipline not to do the, oh, the, the, the work, yeah, 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 the, the windmill. The yeah, windmill. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I thought yeah. for sure it might come out. But. Low ceilings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, so we're gonna hear another song from this upcoming album. Yeah, another song from Lay Your Darkness Down. This is called Sense of Wonder, and uh, you know when you get a diagnosis, a big life change like that, sometimes, a lot of times, the natural inclination is to just kind of withdraw into yourself, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet we live in this beautiful, majestic, miraculous world. And uh, there's such comfort in nature and in experiencing 
the natural world. And so this is a song that predated my diagnosis, but it really speaks to that need to just always be fully experiencing this, this beautiful world as, as much as you can. So uh, this is called Sense of Wonder. Awesome. <laughs> Giant squid and butterflies, creatures big and mighty, low and small. We can only guess how many kinds with which we share this big blue ball. They say that we know less about the bottom of the ocean than we do about the surface of the moon. So if you ever lose your sense of wonder, honey, it'll be too soon. Every day a new frontier The backyard was a jungle green and wild But it gets harder to remember What came as second nature to a child You know the names of all the roads But the lawn needs to be mowed And there's work to pay the bills and make the rent You might wake up one day And never wonder where your sense of wonder went Ooh. Mysteries within mysteries, like an endless set of Russian nesting dolls. And if we could ever get there, we'd find a question at the center of it all. Why something instead of nothing? Are we out here on our own? Or does someone or something catch us when we fall? Without a sense of wonder, it begins to seem so tragic and so small. But it ain't all unicorns and rainbows Surely you've suspected this by now Some days feel like a competition To find the biggest way to let each other down I don't blame you if you're worried Sometimes I'm worried too And don't believe it when I say it'll all work out Cause it don't seem to make no sense And it's no wonder sometimes we all have our doubts made of stardust, electrons dance into a cosmic reel. Light is particle and wave, but even this cannot explain the way it feels. So give all you have to give, cause at best it's relative. Love is how we pull each other through. Hold on to your sense of wonder, keep yours for me and I'll keep mine for you. Never lose your sense of wonder, babe. Keep yours for me and I'll keep mine for you. I love that song. Oh, thank you. Me too. <laughs> I absolutely Me too. love that song. Oh, thank you so um, much. I, I know the first time uh, I heard it, it, it felt to me like you were giving, I know you've got a, you've got a couple boys, and it felt like you were giving guidance to them about the world ahead of them and, and life ahead absolutely. of them. And it just, uh, yeah, it, it's beautiful. Yeah, well, it's something we're all, we're all born with, you know, and I think there's a lot of modern culture that conspires to kind of... Uh, slowly bleed it out of us. And it's, it's, it's worth remembering, you know, even as adults, that you can just 
make some space and some time in your life to be utterly awestruck and, and bewildered by, you know, the mysteries around us. It's not like we know everything, you know? And uh, to me, that's the thing that I find so inspiring about nature is the, the infinite amount of questions that it, that it contains. Like, you know, I said in that song, that there's a question at the center of, of it all. You know, you never, you never figure out really the final answer, I don't think. And right. that's what I love about it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really, uh, it's beautiful. The lyric is beautiful. Um, the guitar, play, I, I mean, if we were talking a little bit earlier, I, yeah. I tried to play the guitar, not very well, but the idea of playing and singing at the same time, now that's really, <laughs> talk about awestruck, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's well, a trick. Well, that, uh, that, that guitar part in particular, I, sometimes I'm playing it in my finger, there's a lot of finger, fancy finger picking there, and uh -huh. then my hand's kind of seizing up a lot of the times when I'm playing <laughs> it, and I'm going, whose idea was it to have this many notes happen this quickly for this long? And yeah. it's you know, no yeah. one but myself to that's blame. That's it, that's it. Um, uh, I wanted to shift and just talk a little bit about, so your world now, post-diagnosis, yeah. and um, for those at home who don't know exactly what living with retinitis pigmentosa is and what it feels like and what your day-to-day -day experience is like. Um, so for example, if you're walking down the street in bright daylight, um, the world around you may not look all that different than when, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, whereas yeah. Uh, backstage at a gig, it may be dramatically different. Maybe you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, that's that is the tough thing. Uh, is that under you know regular daylight conditions with my glasses on, I have 20/20 vision. I mean, there's my central field of vision is is fine thus far, um, thankfully. But the the challenge with me is that. Um, you know, there's the blind, uh, the night blindness, and and the peripheral vision stuff. Most of the conditions that I work under are the conditions that I have a real trouble with. So I would say, you know, 75% of my work happens in conditions that are are either near darkness or dim enough that they feel problematic to me in terms of tripping over things or you know being able to safely navigate. So it's been a real uh, it's been a real journey to to kind of go back to places that I maybe hadn't been to in a couple of years because of the pandemic. I've got glasses now, but other than that, I look totally the same that I used to look. Mm -hmm. And yet perception, you know, uh, as far as perceptions go from, uh, f from me of the outside world, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. And it's very contextual. So I can be walking into a room with a, a, a window on the far side and the light is coming in and hitting me in the face and I may not be able to see what's in a bowl on the table. And, uh, but if I happen to walk around that table and glance back with the window at my, at my back, I can see that there are, are mushrooms in that bowl and I don't want to eat those. So, you know, it, I, it's just, it's very contextual and I'm still learning all the ways that it, that, that it can be affected and the ways that it's chain, it changes. And um, in that way, places that have been very familiar to me that I've visited for 20 years or more, um, I have to approach in a completely novel way. And I have to do that either, I either have to do that on my own trying to pass for the way that I used to be or I have to um, ask for help Mm -hmm. And um, that's a hard thing to do, uh, especially, you know, someone like myself, I pride myself on being independent and, and doing my homework and taking care of the things that are my responsibility. And um, usually, you know, walking into a room is my responsibility, <laughs> but right. I, 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 it's a, it can be challenging now. Right. Um, and uh, so I've been working with venues. Uh, mm -hmm. I just kind of fell into into the that role of of working with venues because I, what I've seen is that oftentimes the front of house where the audience and the customers and the patrons are, they've got the ramps or they've got the elevators or they've got the lights on the stairs or or any number of uh, accessibility you know accommodations. But backstage, uh, it may be dark mm -hmm. and the stairwell may be you know you know really. Uh, tight to navigate and there's no tape on the stairs so I don't I can't tell where the forward edge of the stair is and the implication I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily intended but the the unintended implication that I like to think is that well of course we've got you know our dis disabled 
patrons are, are taken care of out there, but why would there be any disabled people backstage? This is where the artists are. Right. And now I'm in this slightly awkward position of saying like, I know I don't look it, but I, I am part of that group now too, especially mm -hmm. under these conditions. These are some things that would really help me out. And I have found, you know, by and large, everyone to be um, really wonderfully responsive. You know, if I say like, you'd really, those stairs with tape on the forward edges, that would really help me. They, they, usually the response is, oh, that would really help everyone. I don't know why we haven't done that already. Sure. Um, it's not always that responsive, but um, when, when it isn't, I travel with my own little mini flashlight and my headlamp and my, my uh, you know, fluorescent tape, and I will full on go and put you know, fluorescent tape along the, uh, the, the leading edges of the stairs at an opera house backstage or something if I have to, and uh, just do it for myself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that you're being proactive and saying, I'm not going to try to pretend. I'm not going to put myself um, in danger. I'm not going to just uh, yeah. try to pretend something, you know, you're being authentic to who you are and what your reality is. I'm trying to have a problem-solving-oriented uh, problem oriented mindset, sure. you know? Uh, I don't want it to feel like it's more challenging to work with me, you know, either as mm -hmm. a, an artist or a sideman. I want people to know that I'm actively, you know, looking for ways to navigate my surroundings safely and to be able to do my job to the fullest extent. And I feel like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing that. Um, but it just sometimes takes a little extra time, a little extra communication in advance. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I must have, I might have been Midwestern in a previous life or something. I'm always like, oh, no, no, I'm fine. Don't, don't worry about me. But there's times now when I really need something to, yeah. and, I, and I have yeah. to advocate for it. That's right. And it's, it, it can be, still be a little awkward sometimes, but um, I just kind of push through it and think, well, I'm helping, I'm gonna benefit from this, but someone else is gonna be helped by it too. That's right, yeah, no, that's, that's such a great mindset. Um, so I know we've got one more song. Yeah. And, uh, but before we, before we do that, um, tell our folks at home, where can they find your music and, uh, and learn more about, about you and your, your upcoming album? The great thing is that they, they probably already have access to it because if they're on streaming platforms, any number of streaming platforms online, it's all on there and they can find me under my name uh, on uh, the major streaming platforms. Um, if they're old school, they can find me in a lot of the record stores. Uh, and uh, I have a, a wonderful website um, and uh, they can sign up on the mailing list there. And that's really the best way to, to kind of keep abreast of my music. Um, You'll know when I'm coming through your neighborhood. I'll, I'll let you know, and I'll send you an email every month. And uh, and uh, the new record comes out on on uh, February 3rd. It's called Lay Your Darkness Down. And uh, if you're on the mailing list, you'll you'll you won't be able to avoid it. Awesome, <laughs> that's good. And and for those who um, are at home, Mark M A R K Irelli E R E L L I dot com. Thank you for that. Yeah, my <laughs> pleasure. And the Foundation Fighting Blindness's website is fightingblindness.org. And at our website, you can learn all about the Foundation Fighting Blindness, upcoming events, you can join a chapter. Um, and if you are affected with an inherited retinal disease or age-related macular degeneration, we have a ton of resources on our website, including education, research updates, um, connections with physicians, retinal specialists, low vision specialists, local to where you are, a ton of research and, um, and resources available, again, at www.fightingblindness.org. So we've got one more song tonight. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for um, taking time and spending with us here tonight, Mark. Well, I'm so um, grateful. Thank you for coming. So this is from your 2016 album, For a Song? Yes, it's the title track uh, to that, to that uh, record. And uh, it goes like this. All right. Weathered stones I fished out from some rushing mountain stream Yellowed books with dog-eared pages And wildflowers pressed between Postcards 
from every place where I laid me down to sleep. Little souvenirs to remind you of me. All the road is not your friend, it's just a means to win it. How I wish I could take you along, but I'll take it all on faith that you'll understand someday. Why I did all I did while I was gone for a song. I catch a glimpse, a glint of something shining somewhere in the great unknown. And like a beast, I chase it over hills and mountains, valleys, rivers, till it's cornered on a scrap of paper on a bedside table in some cheap motel with a highway drums. And sometimes it feels like church, sometimes like I'm the last man on earth. Just a voice howling out into the darkness. All the road is not your friend, it's just a means to an end. I'll be home late, don't wait up, just leave a light on. But I'll take it all on faith that you'll understand someday. Why I did all I did while I was gone for a song. All the road is not your friend, it's just a means to an end. How I wish I could take you along, but I'll take it all. been a presentation of Music to Our Eyes, a Foundation Fighting Blindness music series.